Hi, I'm Jesse Dillon, and this is my co-host, Priscilla. Priscilla Cohen. Thanks. Uh, today's conversation is with conservative political consultant and Senator John McCain's campaign manager, Rick Davis. We're going to talk about a lot of 70s and 80s politics with stories about Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and Bob Dole. But first, please subscribe to my YouTube channel to watch this and more episodes, or subscribe to Jesse's Office wherever you stream your podcasts. And feel free to leave comments and reviews, particularly the good reviews, and we will try to respond whenever we can. Thanks for watching. Things. This is a little psychotic. I mean, it's really nice. It's like you know, it's like all those crime dramas where the guy goes in the room and he's like got all these pictures of his girlfriend. And you know, it's, no, there. It's uh, you know what happens is like when you work on all these projects, you always need ideas and things. So yeah. you're, you might be uh, looking at things, so you chop them up into little pieces and then you keep them up there. <laughs> So that you can think of more ideas, you know. It what makes I mean? you think of more ideas. Oh well, well the three of us are lined up. Yeah. This is oh, yeah, yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, now, did you have foam ceilings before you started the podcast this, program, yes. or is this yeah, part no, of? Yeah, we've had the foam well, ceilings for years. I have had the foam ceilings. They were there was no. This used to be a director named Michelle Gondry's office, very famous director. His office was here when he was here at Wondrous, and uh, uh, he had he would do sound down here. So oh, I see. So it was always a sound thing. <laughs> We're here talking let's about talk yeah. about Jesse. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about Priscilla. Yeah. Oh, no. So, no, no. Rick, do you remember the first time you met John McCain? Uh, the first time I met John McCain, uh, yeah, it was a long, long time ago. Uh, yeah. I was a little uh, junior politico uh, in 1984. Right. I was charged with uh, uh, delegate selection for the Ronald Reagan re-election effort, right. which, by the way, when no one's running against you, delegate selection's <laughs> the place you want to be, right? right? right. It's like, and the, but then I got this order from Jim Baker that um, that delegate selection had to be a little different this time around. We had this gender gap that yeah. you know was pretty famous at the time, and and we had to have fifty percent of the delegates going to the national convention become women, right? Good and call. and I thought, oh yeah, it's a good yeah. call. We yeah. I, that should be easy, right? Well, yeah. that was not easy. Right. <laughs> Bunch of you know stodgy white Republican guys didn't right. want to give up their party <laughs> seat, right? right. <laughs> and I think prior to that, we'd had maybe thirty eight percent women at any convention. So I had to like almost double it to get to that number. And the one of the very last convention we had a lot of conventions in those days to pick delegates right. was Arizona. Right. And I was short. I was not at my fifty percent. So I show up in Arizona and I tell the party chairman, hey, I got to get, you know, like 60% of your delegation, if not the whole thing, right. to be women. He's like, you're out of your mind. Right. You'll have to talk to John McCain, who was a congressman in right. those days. And um, so I met John for the first time. But, and, it, but did you, was he already a powerful congressman? Yeah, I mean, this, this party chairman was basically deferring to this, you know, uh, second term congressman. Right. And, uh, and he was a powerhouse, right? I mean, he, he knew how to play the game, uh, and he was immediately a sensation within the Republican Party. Right. Reagan loved him right. because they knew him even back when he was a POW. When Reagan was uh, governor, right. uh, he really went out of his way to uh, do things for the POWs. And so John uh, got to know uh, Reagan like before, long before he ever had a political right. ambition in his life, right. right out of coming out of Vietnam. Do you remember that first moment that you met him and what it, what you, were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, I thought he was short, right? I mean, like, <laughs> gee, I thought you were like this big guy. I was right. like, hero. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he came in and he was like totally normal and no pretense about him whatsoever. And, and, and he made you immediately feel at ease. Right. And, uh, and, and I did, and I was a very young guy, I did, you know, but I'd been around the block. I'd been to like 40 state conventions by right. now. I've cut these deals. It was getting to be pretty routine, right. and uh, and I explained the strategy, and he completely embraced it. And said, "Yeah, absolutely, that's what we got to do." Yeah, and he's like, "Look, we'll 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 do the whole delegation. We'll just go all the way." Yeah, and uh, and there's a great narrative for us. We can say. We're standing by the Women's Federation, who have always been working in the trenches for right. the Republican Party, and we're going to give them our the chance to celebrate Reagan's uh, renomination. 
I'm like, great, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, you're really doing me a big favor, and yeah. I know the president will really be happy about that. He's like, I got one thing I need in return. <laughs> I'm like, oh, anything. Yeah. I'm like, what could it be? Yeah. And in those days, um, in politics, uh, sort of the top of the food chain for political operatives was being a regional political director in a presidential campaign. That right. meant you you managed a bunch of states and right. you were the you called all the shots, the yeah. media, the polling, yeah. the organization, it all reported to you. Yeah. And the guy who ran the western southwestern states was a, a fellow who John did not like. Right. And he's like, I don't want him at the convention. If you want me to bring a delegation of women to the yeah. convention, yeah. he doesn't get to go. Yeah. How hard is that, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. So I called my guy, Lee Atwater, who was you know my boss, yeah. and s- told him what was going on. And, and in this campaign organization, uh, the regional political directors reported to, 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 uh, to Atwater, and he said, yeah, sure, cut that deal. Yeah. Done, cut that deal. And everything was great. I felt so wonderful, and right. John was enthusiastic and organized a whole press conference yeah. the next morning of the convention, and they, they stood up, and they had all the Federation of Republican women yeah. you know, in behind them, and they said, we're all stepping aside to allow these women to be delegates to the Republican National Convention and support Ronald Reagan. And I'm thinking, wow, this is great. I'm, I'm, I hit my 50%. Yeah. I can glide. And, um, and the next thing I know... Uh, I get grabbed from behind and slammed up against the wall. And here's John McCain right in my grill. I mean, like, that guy was fuming. And And was this a different John McCain? This was a different John McCain. (laughs) This is a John McCain that I probably knew was always inside there, but I didn't want to actually meet this John McCain. And he's like, you lied to me, you son of a bitch. Uh, He's a sailor. He probably a few other expletives and deletives at the time. And, uh, And said, you know, uh, I heard that, you know, the RPD is going to be coming to the convention. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Don't hurt me. Yeah. Um, so I said, let's talk to Lee Atwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's the boss. Yeah. And so I'm scrambling around. In those days, we didn't have cell phones or anything. So I'm like grabbing change. We go yeah. to a pay phone. Right. We're right in the middle of this convention. Right? right. People are wondering, why is this guy got, you know, his his, his hands around Rick? And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I call up and I get through to Lee Atwater and I'm like, Lee, I've got you know, Congressman McCain right here, and yeah. he's heard that Masana is coming to the convention, the RPD, and and you got to tell him the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets on, and sure enough, he's like, look, yeah, this was the deal we cut yesterday. It's fair. Uh, don't worry about it. it he, he's not going to be coming to the convention. Right. And, like, literally as if the lights switch just got turned off yeah. and the room got dark and comfortable again. <laughs> and it was like, okay, thanks. You know, hung up. And it was like, okay, we're good. And he walked away. Now, were and, you sweating whether the guy was coming or not? Uh, no. After that, I figured I was, <laughs> like, I could always leave town. <laughs> Wasn't going to be coming back to Phoenix anytime soon. Little did I know what my future would hold for John McCain. Well, let's now, go did back. You, I did have a you, question. Well, okay, what are you going to say? All right, let me go, let me go first. What what got you into politics? What, why did you even want to be doing this? I mean, what? How did you even get there? I was a real nerd, uh, and politics tends to attract nerds. Uh, my mom was a, a, a politically active Republican in Maryland, and uh, and they needed something for me to do one summer in 1972, and they stuck me in a Winnebago with a bunch of Nixon re-election guys, and we'd roll into parking lots, and I'd hand out bumper stickers and buttons, and 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 that was my first political event, right? right. And it was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I had the kind of personality that didn't mind walking up to people in a parking lot. In those days, it was safer. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't carry guns. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and, and I kind of liked it. So dial it forward. I go down to the University of Alabama, freshman. Uh, didn't know anybody uh, in Alabama. The day I showed up there, I was from, you know, Maryland, Virginia uh, area. And um, one of the very first people I met was the college Republican chairman, of Alabama, and I didn't even know there was such a thing. And I got to be really good friends with this guy. And um, sure enough, he was getting out of the job of being college Republican chairman the second semester of my freshman year. And he's like, you should do this. You're good at this stuff. You should be, you know, the college Republican chairman. I said, I don't know anything about that. He says, it's easy. Here's what you do. You get in your car, you fill it up with a cooler of beer, and you go around <laughs> to other colleges, and yeah. you, you you meet girls, and you give them beer, and yeah. you sign them up to be members, and then you're the most powerful person in the state because these are all folks who are your friends. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. And by the end of my freshman year, I was the college Republican chairman of Alabama. But and now, you must have felt some—I mean, did you— 
Did you always know you were a Republican? Did you always? Did I just you, assumed I was because my mom told me I was. So I mean, <laughs> like, I didn't really the, overthink what, it a lot. What was the, the Democratic president doing? Was he doing the same thing or she doing the same thing? Well, in Alabama, I was like the only Republican, right? right. I mean, yeah. like, in, in, it, when you grow up in the East, there were a lot of Republicans in those days. In yeah. fact, the Republican Party was mostly East Coasters, right? right? They were right. moderate yeah. Republicans from the East Coast. Yeah. You went down to Alabama, and they were all conservatives, but they were Democrats. Right. Yeah. And so... I was definitely in the minority group, right? right. And, and so what, what happened was I learned, you know, the ropes pretty quick and I figured out that, you know, we were the small potatoes in, in this state. And, uh, and yet what was happening at the time was that there was a significant realignment occurring. And I couldn't have told you that at the time. Right. I just thought I was a genius, right? And so yeah. more and more people right. who I knew who were Democrat conservatives were saying, Democratic Party's not for me anymore. Right. Sounds like Republicans are going to be more conservative. And we got on the front end of the whole Reagan move in 1976 yeah. where, you know, he was the future of the Republican Party. And most of the Southerners thought, well, that's the leader I want. And, of course, that's exactly what Ronald Reagan went through. He had been a Democrat right. yeah. and yeah. thought, ah, oh, I've been abandoned by this party. They've drifted left. And I was a conservative. And, uh, and so... That was happening all through the South, and Alabama was no exception. So, but, but but you so you do that in Alabama. You 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 start to gather strength in Alabama personally. But when do you actually meet Lee Atwater, and do you know that that's a seminal relationship on the day you actually meet him, or do you even know what that is? Uh, so I sort of backed my way into it. Uh, once I became college Republican chairman of Alabama, all of a sudden I was in a group of fifty leaders around the country in my age group who were running the Republican Party of, uh, in, at the college age. Uh, and it was a big deal. Uh, I remember I went to a, uh, a training camp in Mississippi in my uh, so- sophomore year of college because once I became, they're like, well, we got to train you how to run a campaign. I'm like, well, great. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as you can tell, I'm sort of the, the sort of do- shaggy dog yeah. who will go for anything. <laughs> how much, how long do you want to throw that ball? Because yeah. I'll run any time yeah. you want. And, uh, and so I go to Mississippi, never been to Mississippi. Yeah. It seemed like a nice place. Yeah. A lot of pretty girls there too. Yeah. And, uh, and I met probably six of the people. Uh, who were going to be the most seminal players in my political career, literally for as long as as, as I practiced politics. But Lee was, I mean, he was a special. And he was there. He was one of the teachers. And do you remember meeting him? And did you did you think anything of it, or was he just a regular teacher? Oh, he's a really cool guy. I thought, wow, this guy's so smart. He knows yeah. so much about this stuff. Yeah. And he's been running governor's races in South Carolina, and he plays in a rock band. Yeah. And, like, I want to be like him, yeah. except I can't carry a tune. Yeah. I, mean, that's, I could cover the political side, but not the music side. Now, did that all crystallize in Reagan's campaign? Did, did those relationships yes. come together? And, yeah, and there what, was a pathway, but yeah. um, I think that's a good way to put it. They crystallized around the Reagan campaign. So yeah. by the time Reagan uh, was the odds-on favor to win the nomination, I had matriculated up to working at the RNC, right. and, uh, and, and all my friends were on the Reagan campaign. And right. so when they, you know, there was a whole effort underway to convert the RNC into sort of a Reagan model once the primary was done, right. and, and I was there ready to receive my orders. Wait, yeah. I have a question. Why were the, to back up for a minute, why were the Democrats leaving? What was going on? You said, you know... Purely ideological. So... It, there was a massive switch going on where the Republican Party was the party of the Northeast moderates, right? The chairman of our party was Bill Brock, who was a good moderate guy from Tennessee, and 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 we didn't have conservatives in our party, right? And the, the Democratic Party was really the party of the South and the Midwest, and and these were conservative um, um, uh, ideological voters. And part of what was happening was um, um, a process that Nixon really started, which is Southern strategy, which is how do we convert uh, Southern conservatives uh, to the Republican Party? And there were wedge issues along the way. Right. And this, I wouldn't have known it at the time, but when you read the history books and study politics, these are the things that are just immutable. This, the, the turn started in the 70s, and by 1980, uh, you, you had literally... 100 state legislators from Louisiana switching their party allegiance in one day, right? right? That's realignment. 
and it was happening all throughout the South and in a lot of parts of the country because Reagan was able to, I think, galvanize a new, uh, more conservative country. The, if you look at the national polls in 1978, 79, and 80, the country was drifting right. So, you know, it was a, it was a part of a more broad macro trend in people's views uh, becoming a little bit more conservative. And part of what was driven was economic issues, right? And so uh, smaller government, less taxes. People don't remember, but we had a, we had a, a, a top tax rate of 70% right. in, in 1979. Right. Um, we had uh, what was called the misery index, where it was a combination of inflation and taxes and all that just added up to a lot of economic problems. And Reagan was the smaller government, lower taxes, stronger national defense, conservative philosophy of government, and that convinced a lot of Southern Democrats to become Republicans. Now, do you, at the beginning of that, because you're sort of in the guts of the organization at that point, but do they say, does somebody say, listen, you, know, you just listed off the four issues. Are those considered wedge issues? And do you start on a blackboard and it has 20 issues? And then you go, wait, we're going to reduce it down to these four issues? Like, how does that, right. what's that process like at that time? Yeah. It's, it's really not much changed over time. Uh, first thing you do is take a survey and find out what people care about and where the, where the differences are. So who are the people who already support you and why? And then who are the people who are influenceable, right, mm -hmm. who you can actually have a conversation with, who you can convince to come to you? And then who are those people who, like, there's just no way? Yeah. And you, and you, you isolate them and yeah. say, you know what? We really don't care about yeah. those issues. Yeah. They're going to have them. And in this case, for instance, health care, right? So healthcare was very important to a lot of Democratic voters. We knew we did not have a competitive message for them, so we just didn't talk about it. Right. So there were people, Charlie Black, I remember, was the very first person who ever told us, we don't want to fight on their battlefield. Mm. Right. And their battlefield was healthcare. Right. So as long as we're talking about healthcare, it's good for them. So let's stick to our knitting and, as you described, uh, come up with the three or four issues that we think will not only solidify our base but turn on these independents or non-aligned voters who we need in order to win win victory. You know, when Reagan was elected, was that a, uh, uh, were you expecting that he would win? I think it wasn't a surprise to me that he won. It was a shock to me that he won by so much. Yeah. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, I was coming back from a phone bank in Richmond, Virginia, and I was driving up I-95, which is like the worst road in America, right. trying to listen to my radio and get reports on what was going on in the election because I wanted to get to the national headquarters in time for the party, right? Because I was ready to go. <laughs> this was it. Yeah. And, you know, we'd, we'd been doing all the get out the vote calls. Virginia was one of my states that I had to take care of. And, you know, so I was the headquarters for the, the Reagan campaign was in Richmond. I'd spent the whole day there making sure the phone banks were getting out the vote. I felt confident enough that everything was in good shape. I'm driving up 95. And, and, and I just, it was more and more commentary about how obvious it was that, that Reagan was going to be the president. And so I get into traffic. So I'm stuck right. on I-95 in the middle of the greatest moment of my political life. Yeah. It's the like, first presidential campaign I've ever been on, and we're winning, and I can't celebrate. And the next thing I know is I'm hearing all these reports about not only are we winning by big margins in the Northeast, but we're winning all these Senate races. And at that time, we didn't think we were going to win any of those Senate races, right? right? And so because a lot of these people that, that, that the Republicans beat were icons, right, in, within the Democratic Party, bigger than life senators, and, and they were tumbling like, like, like blocks, and, and that was a shock. So by the time I finally got to the headquarters, yeah, you know, we were all the way into past the Mississippi River on vote count, and and we were picking up the United States Senate. We'd won like eight new Senate races, right? And that was a shock. It was a it was a, a slaughter of epic proportion, right? And we we woke up the next morning, um, you know, having gained not just the White House but the Senate, an enormous amount of power. Is it about the winning? Like, is it for you? Is it about the campaign? Like, what happens the next day? First of all, you sober up. That was my okay. number one task. <laughs> yeah. okay. I had a raging headache, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so uh, you start you're talking to all your friends who are on the campaign. You're really excited about what the prospect holds. You're now in 
in power, right? Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know what that meant, really. Yeah. Uh, most of the, the work I'd ever done is at state level politics, right. and I'd never been involved in a Senate race or a congressional race, or this was my first presidential race. And so, wow, this was really cool. I grew up in Washington, right. so to actually be a part of a winning team was really neat. And uh, and I got a call saying, "Oh, you're you're gonna you're gonna go to work for Drew Lewis. He's gonna run the transition." I'm like, "Oh, great! What's a transition?" Yeah. yeah. And literally reported the next day, and um, wound up doing you know, 50,000 thank you notes and helping to set up the cabinet and uh, and doing some really cool stuff with a small team around Drew. And as, as is Washington and transitions, halfway through the transition, Drew Lewis is the, the chairman of the transition. He gets appointed to be secretary of transportation. Right. And so I'm like, well, who do I work for? Yeah. Because uh, I just lost my boss. And they're like, oh, just keep cranking out those thank you notes. You'll be told later. And uh, and, and and next thing you know, uh, Dennis Whitfield, who was uh, another operative who I worked with at the RNC in those days, was like, we're going to do the first cabinet meeting for Reagan. I'm like, great. What's a cabinet meeting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we orchestrated in December, uh, right after the election, the first uh, meeting of the cabinet before it was really – uh, constituted uh, over at the State Department. So you're getting on-the-job training, basically. Oh, yeah, I'm walking you into know, rooms with of, people who I read about yeah. in the newspaper every yeah. day, and I'm like, wow. And is it interesting Cap Weinberg, you? yeah, I just read about you. But is that part is w- interesting as well? Like yeah, it was fascinating, the, right? the mechanics. I mean, suffice it to say, most of what I'd done in politics at that point in time, my, my lengthy, you know, six-year career in yeah. politics was as an operative, right, doing the mechanics, right, uh, telephone banks, get out to vote, uh, recruitment, organization, uh, things like that. And, uh, and so the fact that I was doing it at a different level uh, with people in the room who, you know, I'd read about, I'd never met, uh, who would be managing huge swaths of the world right. was pretty cool. And what is about that? You know, we talked about John McCain and maybe Jesse wants to ask you about President Reagan, but is there something different about those people that are, what is it about those people? What is it about John? What was it about President Reagan that makes them those people? Why are they different than us? Are they different than us? Yeah, they're different. Um, the first time I actually met Reagan was a, a, a better metaphor than I can give you on anything at the White House was we were doing an event in Mississippi. And uh, and this was before the campaign even started up. And, and I'd been asked to come over and help out. I was still in school in Alabama. And, uh, but I was hanging around with a lot of the Mississippi crowd who were all Reagan guys. And, uh, and so I'm organizing the green room and helping out. It was actually in a church. And so it's this back room that was the staff room. And I'm sort of organizing the staff room and making sure there's enough Coca-Cola and stuff for uh, Governor Reagan, who we called him that at the time. And, uh, and I'm fiddling around with the nuts and eating half the, the food beans. that was in there. And <laughs> next thing you know, Ronald Reagan walks right through the door. I mean, he didn't have any you know, Secret Service, right. it was just him. And uh, and he starts chatting me up and and I, you know, got him, you know, some something to drink. And uh, and he, it was like talking to my dad. I mean, he was just the most at ease, but he had a he had a presence about him. There was charisma. He's a big, tall, good looking guy, so you you can't help but fall in love with the presence of him himself. And uh, but his familiarity, I'd never met him before. He wasn't a president at that time, but you could tell there was a gravitas around him, right? He was on a mission, and that mission was already started, and he was running for president. And, uh, and, and you know, I felt like I was already a part of that just by being in the room with him. And, you know, you mentioned tougher, you know, when you, when you say that. Is that an important element in, in leadership, in, in government? Yeah, uh, I think it is. Um, uh, you know, politics and government are not easy, right? These are not jobs that are, uh, you do a good job and you get the reward, right? It's not like that. Uh, many times you get punished in politics or in government for doing the right thing, right? You could actually do a fantastic job, but if the political uh, waters change, the, 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 the wind changes direction, and you find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, you can get hammered. It, and it doesn't ever mean that that's a permanent condition. If you're tough, you just soldier through it. Right. And, and you live to fight another day. All these anecdotes like that actually apply. And, and so I've seen a lot of my colleagues, people who came up with me, um, who 
didn't like the roughness of the game, go home, right? right? I mean, Washington is full of people from states, right? right? I know there are some people there who actually live there, right. <laughs> but like in my youth growing up until the, the you know, day I, I'm probably what, 30, 40 years old, most of my friends were people from Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, other states that I'd worked in who came to Washington to work for congressmen, for senators, for the administration. And, 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 90% of them wind up going home. Right. And they go home because, not because it's not interesting and not because the people aren't fascinating and the issues are incredible. It's because it's a tough environment. But what's tough? Like, what, what happens? I mean, well, is it just backstabbing? Well, you start, with the, you start with the hours. There are no hours, right? There's no such thing as an eight-hour day in, in politics, right? right? It's a 24-hour clock. It's not unusual to, I remember one night I'm at the RNC with Lee Atwater as chairman and he's like, okay, you know, uh, let's go get the newspapers. And it's 11 o'clock at night. And in those days, Washington Post put their papers out on the curb outside of their headquarters over on, you know, K Street uh, at 11 o'clock at night. And so if you wanted to get ahead of the news cycle, we didn't have computers, we didn't have Google, we didn't have right. any of that stuff. You literally got in a car with the chairman of the RNC, you drove over and you picked up a newspaper and you read about what kind of bad day you were gonna have the next day. Right. And you started at 11 o'clock at night preparing for a 7 a.m. press conference. Right. And that was every single day, every day of the week, right? You don't get a day off on Sunday, you don't get to play golf on Saturday. And so a lot of people aren't prepared to make that sacrifice. That's number one. Number two is um, the turf you occupy is yours only as long as you occupy it, right? And there, politics adhors a vacuum, right? And so when a vacuum is created, a lot of people move in on that. And so you, you can't not accomplish your task, right? So if you don't accomplish your task, you're gonna have 10 other people standing there ready to, to do it uh, in a way that they think they can do it. Never having been in government, you know, me and Priscilla, not in government. I'm not. <laughs> no. You know, what's a day like? Like when you're going to try and decide something and you're the president, what is that negotiation back and forth with your own team to try and figure it out? Are they in active conversations? Do they just come into them once in a while? Do they like, what's the, what's the machinery of government like? Yeah. It, it, look, I mean, part of what's interesting about government is it changes with the head of state, right? If we're talking about the White House, it's the president. And each president has a different style. I would dare say Reagan's style was dramatically different than than Donald Trump's style. And uh, and even uh, Bill Clinton's style and others who have occupied the Oval Office. Reagan's style was, he liked pre-cooked meetings, right? He liked everything to be staffed out and, and figured out, and he would make the final decision. So when I was doing domestic policy for him, our job was to have lots of meetings, lots of cabinet council meetings, lots of sub-cabinet level meetings. We'd percolate issues up from the bottom to the top. And then by the time the memo went to the president, it was, we've thought this through, here's what we believe the solutions are, A, B, C, D, right? Here's the choices we think we have, it's up to you. And he would make those decisions based on a thoughtful program. Now, that meant he'd sat through hours of cabinet meetings where it was discussed, and not necessarily for a decision, but to inform. And so uh, when it finally came time for a decision, he liked to be in his office and go through that, and he would call in whoever he felt was relevant to that decision to ask their advice. But it was, it was at that point, pretty cooked. And, you know, in, in, he would always create an obstacle to those outcomes, right? So he would say, okay, I'm gonna select this option for implementation, but I want it done in a different way. And, and he would always fashion it his way. Now, Reagan was a relatively easy president to work for on policy because he had a very well-defined history, right? I mean, you knew where Reagan was on almost every single issue and he never vacillated. I mean, part of what made him unique is he had thought of what he wanted the world to look like, the country to look like, his state of California to look like a long time ago, and he wasn't changing, right? right? That was set in stone. So whether you thought it was right or wrong or how it polled, it didn't matter. He was where he was, and your job was to make it work. Yeah. And so that was a simplicity to it that most people don't give him credit for. We've now been through many presidents, especially the current one, who change their mind on a daily basis on fundamental issues and fundamental uh, philosophy, and that has to be extremely hard 
for someone who works there not knowing what any given day is going to bring. How do you get to John McCain and the journey with John McCain? Because you've been on the journey with him for a long time. Yeah. So That's only because I'm old. <laughs> um, you know, I spent a lot of time not, not dealing with John McCain at all. I mean, after that experience in 1984... Uh, and by the way, very successful national convention, I might add, uh, that um, uh, I didn't really come into contact with him again until 1996. And, uh, and I was part of the Dole campaign. Right. And uh, the irony, uh, it was pretty thick. Um, uh, one of Bob Dole's best friends in the United States Senate was John McCain. Right. Uh, but John McCain was also best friends with Phil Graham. And Phil Graham ran against Bob Dole for the Republican nomination. John McCain, most people have absolutely no recollection of this, was Phil Graham's chairman of his campaign for president. Right. And so my first job was to beat Phil Graham's brains out. I mean, right. like, make sure he does not, you know, beat uh, uh, Bob Dole. And, of course, it was the classic. Phil was the new. He was the smart. He was from Texas. He was a really cool guy. He was the future of the Republican Party. And there's Dole. Had run before, had lost every time, you know, had, 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 you know, had to be the no guy in the United States Senate as the leader, you know, and, uh, and, and it was the hard sell. And, and Phil Graham never even got to Iowa, right? I mean, right. we were able to literally kill him in the cradle politically. Right. right. And so John McCain had every reason in the world to hate my guts, right? right? I, had, I had been a part of a team that had literally buried Phil Graham's presidential ambitions for life. Right. And, uh, and, and yet in those days, um, um, you know, when you vanquished your primary opponent, you then incorporated their folks into your campaign, right? right. Um, that was still the ethic in those days. And, and that's what we did. So we pulled a bunch of his folks in uh, who were very... Uh, good uh, uh, technicians and 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 John, who was always this guy who never uh, never uh, walked away from a fight, but after the fight, never walked away from the hugs. Right. And 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 he came back and he hugged Bob Dole and he said, "I will do everything I can to get you elected president." Right. And he became a constant traveling companion of Bob Dole after that, uh, everywhere he went, and uh, uh, became a great ally of the campaign. So we re-upped our relationship in, in, on the field of play. You know, now there's all these stories about John when he traveled. Yeah, that was one of the reasons we begged him to get on the plane with Bob Dole, because Bob Dole was like this crazy traveler, right? I mean, he'd be flying over St. Louis on his way to Minneapolis or someplace, and he'd say, hey, let's land here and do an event. Right. And you're like, well, we don't have any advanced men. We don't yeah. have... I mean, like, what, are you kidding? No, no, yeah. land the plane yeah. now, right? And yeah. he would literally get in a car and go to the... The, the you know tower in St. Louis, the arch, and say, "Hey, I'm Bob Dole. I'm yeah. running for president." And there'll like be five people there, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they're not even from that state. Yeah. And uh, and so like we wanted John on there because like that guy was the human dynamo, yeah. right? He never had a travel uh, issue in his life. Now they were they were both military, so did that yep. did that did they share something there? Oh, for sure. I mean, that's one of the reasons they were already best friends, right? Uh, John McCain uh, revered. Bob Dole's heroism and his commitment, uh, and 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 the same. They they were two warriors who'd been beat up pretty hard during war and have come back to serve their country uh, with really no no you know personal upside other than you know their ability to be in public service. Uh, most people really don't know the Bob Dole story, and I'd say the one big regret I have in that campaign is we didn't go back and retell it. Right. You know, we just sort of picked up in current events, and, and that was a great mistake. Bob Dole deserved a chance for his story to be told, you know, as a hero, and we missed that opportunity. So where does it go from, from you're just traveling with John to you now you're going to actually work with him? Well, uh, suffice it to say, the Dole campaign was not successful. Uh, it was very traditional, and I thought, well, you know, I've been through a lot of these now at this stage. Um, uh, and I felt prepared to run a campaign. Um, uh, I'd always had the ambition to do one. I mean, you know, one of my my uh, uh, mentors, Lee Atwater, had sort of been my uh, north star on that. I mean, I, I wanted to do what he did, right? right. And he ran a campaign for president successfully, and that's what I wanted to do. And I thought that I was ready. Um, and but I wanted to do it totally differently, right? I, I sat through. So many meetings and seeing, you know, good decisions washed by the wayside and uh, and bad things implemented and 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 it's not that we could have beat Bill Clinton in 1996, probably not. Roaring economy, very popular guy, 
but I don't think we gave Bob Dole the best chance to win. Right. right. And that's the job of the campaign is right. to not get in the way of success. Uh, and uh, so I was really kind of keen to do something. And I had worked with Elizabeth Dole since the Reagan White House. Uh, part of my portfolio was all the domestic agencies, and she was Secretary of Transportation. And we'd always gotten along really well and, uh, and had a long history. And I, I was ready for a woman president. I just thought that would be so cool. Right. Uh, and uh, I was always a bit of a maverick within the party in that regard. It wasn't, uh, I would say, bashful about taking a chance. And I just thought that was my natural progression, was she was going to run. She deserved a shot at it. She starts with all the Dole Finance Committee, all the Dole organizational groups, all, you know, I mean, like, think of how wonderful a platform she had to move off of. And yet, a great dynamic speaker and candidate. So about halfway through that cycle of two years in, I get a call from uh, John McCain's media uh, advisor, Greg Stevens, who is a good old friend of mine. I'd actually been involved in the, the beginning of his business and said, hey, we've been talking and uh, we'd like to talk to you. Uh, I think John McCain's going to run for president. And uh, amongst the team, we'd like to recommend you to run the campaign. I said, look, I'm really honored that somebody would want me to come in and run a campaign. But I really think this Elizabeth Dole thing is really strong. And I mean, I don't know about John McCain running for president, right? I mean, he had not ever done anything nationally other than uh, traveling with Phil Graham. And I just wasn't sure that that was enough to warrant a run at the presidency. And I pushed that off for a while. And, and Greg Stevens wouldn't let up, right? And, uh, and he gave me this book um, uh, that uh, Tim Berg had written about these six cadets going, or uh, midshipmen going through the Naval Academy, and one of them was John McCain. He goes, you got to read this book about John McCain. It's unbelievable. You'll be inspired. I'm telling you, you're missing the point here. This guy can lead. So I had a, a business uh, trip I had to take to Spain, and I was there for like 10 days, right in the middle of all these discussions. And I'm reading this Tim Berg book, and I'm getting more and more inspired by the story of John McCain, not just the, what, he, what he went through as a young man, but like who he was, right? Decisions he made all along the way just happened to be the right, courageous, smart decisions. And I was really blown away. And, uh, and so uh, I made, you know, and when you get away from the sort of circle, the circus of all this stuff, you can think more clearly. So the best uh -huh. thing I ever did was I left the country and just thought about it. And I realized, Phew, Maybe I'm missing the point. Here's yeah. a group that wants me, and they're a group of people I really trust and, and, and admire. And here's a guy, John McCain, who's really sacrificed a lot, and if he wants to really take a run at it, this could be interesting. So a weird thing happened. It was somewhat fate. Uh, I get on the plane, and I'm flying back to Washington, and on the plane was uh, uh, John Glenn. And John Glenn had just gotten back from space. I mean, he was like a 70-year-old <laughs> astronaut. Yeah. And he was very, very popular. Right. I mean, everybody on the plane was taking pictures with him and all this. And he's literally sitting right across the aisle from me. Uh, and um, we finally settled in. And I didn't say a word. I was like, oh, I don't want to bother him. He's getting hassled by everybody. Even the captain of the plane came out on takeoff and took a picture right. with him. I'm like, hey, don't you have something to do in the plane? Yeah. And... Uh, and so uh, after a requ requisite sort of short snore, you know, on the way I would take off, uh, I whip out the last portion of the Timberg book, and uh, I start reading. And he leans across, and he said, uh, hi, I'm John Glenn. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Yeah. And uh, it's a really interesting book you're reading. And I said, yeah, it's really fascinating. And, and it, you know, I, it never even occurred to me, but I said, yeah, I'm studying up on someone who might be running for president. And at the time, a lot of people had been talking about this guy, Ollie North. Right. And Ollie North is in that book right. as one of the right. midshipmen that they, right. they chronicled. And, of course, he didn't have quite the trajectory that yeah. John McCain did. <laughs> yeah. And I said, no, no, not Ollie North, John McCain. And he's like, John McCain's going to run for president? Yeah. <laughs> it was the first he'd ever heard of that. And, of course, what I didn't remember was the two of them were fast friends in the United States Senate. They were both combat pilots. They were right. both, you know, great American heroes. They had both been in the Keating Five. Yeah. I mean, there were like a lot of parallels. And I got four and a half hours of what a hero John McCain is from probably the biggest hero I'd ever met to my life, mm. yeah. John Glenn. And uh, so I got home, went to the kitchen phone, picked it up, called Greg Stevens, said, I don't know how you pulled off the Glenn thing, yeah. but I'm in. And literally the next morning I was introduced to the John McCain Presidential Advisory Committee 
as the new campaign manager. Long story short, I think it made the right choice. And literally from that point on, you know, that was it like, you know, November of 98. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had a, I've had that relationship. What, what were the qualities of John over time? You know, what, what were the things that made him special? Well, you know, he had, ex- part of what was so convincing to me is he came out of the Dole campaign with exactly the same sensibilities that I did. It's like, we've got to run a different kind of campaign. We can't run a traditional campaign and compete, right? It's just, we, there's too much to do to, to think that we can recreate a successful campaign by just running the same one four years later. And in his view, which I had not really thought about, is how to use the media. Well, my mentor, Lee Atwater, had been one of the very first guys who really understood media relations, right, and, and how to use the media and, and interact with them uh, on getting your message out. And, and John was just like that. I mean, it was the parallels were amazing. Uh, unfettered access. Uh, these are smart people. They'll ask smart questions if you get enough time to get around to it. Um, they've got a job to do, uh, and the more we give them, the more likely is they're going to write us into the story. And 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 that transparency and 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 quote straight talk. It's a it's a crazy phrase now. Everybody overuses it, but at the time, nobody said you actually gave the American public straight talk, right? You took a poll, you found out what they wanted, and you gave it back to them. You never actually told them what you think should happen and hope for the best, right? That was suicide politics, but that was John McCain, right? I mean, he didn't really care about polling. Um, You know, for him, polling was sort of, okay, now we know what they want, let's do what we want to do, and let's see how it affects that. You know, he he obviously wanted to be a a leader, you know, because we're talking about him in the context of a campaign, but he was an incredibly principled person for what he believed in. You know, uh, obviously one of the things that me and Priscilla work on is his commitment to human rights, which we share here at Wondrous. Yep. I guess he learned something or maybe he even had it intrinsically before uh, before he went, he was he was a POW. You know, what do you think those things were? Like, a, what what's that commitment that he was always trying to make? You know, I... One of the things I learned in that Timberg book is his respect for people who don't have power, right? He was for the little guy. Uh, throughout his life, he defended the, the, the guy waiting tables, not the guy demanding service. Um, and, and, and that was a common theme. And you had to really see that throughout literally everything he did, right? Protect the consumer from the corporation. Protect the taxpayer from the government. And, and, and most people side with the power, right? Most people who are leaders want to be part of the power system. And what John McCain wanted to do was to make it an honest system, right? And so he always had suspicion about these institutions in power because he thought they were used more for wrong than right. And, and so he was a bit of a crusader in that regard. And, and that became part of that whole maverick thing, right? He was always pushing against the tide, the tide being the establishment and the tide being the power holders. And he wanted to he wanted to loosen that up because one, it was smart on his part because if he could loosen it up from them, he could get it for himself and use it to empower people who otherwise didn't have it. Uh, at the core of one of the great decisions um, that he made to go after campaign finance reform was to try and uncouple money from speech, right? Because like, if you're powerful and you have money, you want to have more rights to speech. You want to be more influential than the person on the street. John's view was, no, you have to be equal to that person on the street. Right. And so it was fundamental in almost every piece of legislation when he was chairman of the Commerce Committee and he fought for telecom reform. It was because consumers were getting screwed. It wasn't because he was worried about the technology or any of that stuff. He was worried about the consumers. And he became a great... Uh, advocate for consumer affairs. I mean, he, he received every award that these consumer organizations could have, you know, because he was the guy who would champion for the consumer. And who's that anymore? Well, you know, you saw it when, even in the his final, that debate with Obama, actually, that, that it always gets referenced. But, I mean, that decency, there is that decency when he was being attacked Obama was when being Obama attacked, was being, being attacked, attacked right. right? As he was, you know, the whole he wasn't born here and all of that, right. and 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 so the senator was just like, wait, stop. That was a moment where I think everybody saw, regardless of the outcome, he he had the presence of mind and this the heart, like he's in his he's a person standing up for the right thing in that moment. Yeah. 
with his opponent. Yeah, and he'd done that his entire life, and right? I mean, we weren't surprised by that moment, right? Everybody right. likes to reference it because it, yeah. it seems so out of place today right. that anybody would actually push back to a uh, voter. Uh, but that was the core of his entire being in politics was, well, maybe you're not right, and I'm not going to take a poll or go with the tide. He always swam against the tide. There was a day in New Hampshire early in the campaign, long before he'd received the nomination, was running against the president or running against Barack Obama, that, you know, he had more to lose, right? And so we're in New Hampshire. We're, like, you know, desperate to win New Hampshire because without that, you know, his political career for president was ending, and it wasn't a cinch the second time around. And uh, we were in this upstate part of the state, and it's a lot of textiles uh, in that part of the state, uh, textile businesses. And a guy stood up in a room probably with about 100 people in it, and he said, you know, you talk about the new economy and, and the change that's occurring, and uh, I'm a textile worker, and my factory shut down, and, and I don't think this change is helping me at all because what are, what, what, what are my kids, my son, and my daughter going to do for a job now that the textile plant has been shut down? And I'm standing in the back of the room going, uh-oh, this is a classic John McCain moment. And he looks right in the guy's face, and he says, sir, I would hope that you had more ambition for your son and your daughter than to consign them to a life in a textile plant. And I'm like, oh, my God, right. did he just say that yeah. to this guy? Yeah. I mean, like, no empathy for him whatsoever. He's yeah. like, dude, we're going to change the economy of the state yeah. in this country yeah. to accommodate their ambitions, and they no longer have to settle for yeah. a job in a textile plant. And he's like, you're wrong. Yeah, and he he could have said something yeah. very impassioned and sure. saying, you know right. what, you're right. We got to more protectionist trade practices will get that job back, but it wouldn't be true. Yeah, you know, and 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 he then incorporated that into his, into his talks, and he would say some of these jobs aren't coming back. He goes to Michigan and gives a speech in Detroit saying some of these jobs aren't coming back. Now, who does that? Right, yeah. right. I mean, like, but it's honest, yeah. and he'd rather be the truth teller you know, than someone who is pandering to these audiences. You know, we, um, together, the three of us, have been at the Sedona Conference. Actually, you, we got there because you invited us to come. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things about the Sedona Conference, as opposed to a lot of conferences, is that there's a lot of Democrats there. Yep. And, and uh, there's a lot of Republicans. And it's a, is, is that John's legacy that that people still come to Arizona, this incredibly beautiful place, and they meet together to exchange views. Sure. Um, John didn't care about people's party. Um, you know, he cared about change, right? And he used to laugh about, you know, he'd, he'd join any gang that was going to be put together in the United States Senate. Gang of eight, you know, to rewrite the rules on immigration for it. Gang of 12 to, you know, ensure minority rights for picking Supreme Court judges. I mean, like, you name it. And what a gang meant was four, if it was eight, it was four Republicans and four Democrats. If it was 12, it was six and six. I mean, those gangs, he loved to be the gang leader, right? Mm -hmm. And he wasn't always the guy that put it together, but he was the guy that kept it together. And, uh, and, and you know, no better example of that, where he knew that in order to be successful to do the things he wanted to do in the Senate, he had to find Democrats to be his partner. So he reached across the aisle and became Joe Lieberman's best friend, even though Joe Lieberman spent his entire career in the United States Senate trying to win on Democratic issues. He was the party's nominee for vice president, and yet John McCain's best friend. Yeah. And, you know, he went to a freshman senator, uh, 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 Russ Feingold, to say, I'm going to change the way we do campaign finance reform, and I want you to be my partner. And never had talked to Russ about campaign finance reform prior to that, had heard him give a speech saying things like this need to change. And he's like, you and I can do this. And years later, it took a couple tries, they changed fundamentally the way we treat campaign finance reform uh, and took a lot of the, the corruption out of the system, at least until the Supreme Court decision on uh, Citizens United. So, I mean, he just, he just intrinsically knew how to get things done, and he knew it required partnerships. And, and the thing that's unique about John is those partnerships became bonds, right? It didn't really matter whether you were a Democrat or not. You were going to, if you get in a foxhole with John McCain, if you survive it, you'll be his friend for life. Great. Thank you, Rick, so much for coming and talking to us about oh, this stuff. 
Thank you for having any interest in talking to a washed up old Paul. I mean, <laughs> Wait, I, I find it fascinating question. that you I have, have any interest question. here. I have one last question. Though. Sure. Were you shocked um, at the outcome of the 2016 election? Was I shocked at the outcome of the 2016 election? No. Um, uh, and I'm sure you're not talking about John McCain's re-election. No. Um, uh, yeah, on the presidential election, I wasn't shocked because uh, I'd said a year and a half earlier when we had 17 candidates running for president that anybody we nominate was going to beat Hillary Clinton. I mean, I, I knew Hillary. I'd been around her campaign mm -hmm. in 08 when she ran against Barack Obama. Uh, I think fundamentally she was flawed candidate. Uh, independent voters were never going to vote for her. They weren't going to vote for her in 08. They weren't going to vote for her in 16. She couldn't win with them without them. And there wasn't a big enough coalition of Democrats who could make it work. And so, so fundamentally, it's just math, right? I mean, like, I don't think it was a stretch to say whoever we nominate yeah. was going to beat her. What I didn't know is we'd nominate what I thought was the weakest candidate in the field and still win. Now, we it, it was an inside straight. I think anybody else on that uh, group of 17 probably could have beat her straight up, right? Not only uh, electoral votes, but but popular vote. But she was never a popular candidate. Yeah. And she was a very good senator and probably should have stayed in that job, uh, could have done a lot for the state of New York. But, but as a presidential candidate, she had the fatal flaw of not having an appeal to independent voters. You have to come back for another time because we got to talk contemporary politics with you. Yeah. Well, let's do that sometime a little deeper into the Democratic primary yeah, so we yeah. get a sense of I what want, the yeah. 25 are all yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, let's come Done. back. Okay. I'm happy okay. to do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you cool. Thanks for watching or listening. Don't forget to subscribe or click here, here. for the next for the episode. Next.